All right, Eric, welcome to the show, man. I am super excited to have you here. Thanks for having me, Miko. This is going to be fun. I know, man. I am I'm so excited. Like I was telling you before we hit record, uh, your book, The Almanac of Naval, has been one of my favorite books of the last two years because I think it, no, it came out in 2020, right? So it's been like, how long has it been out now? Barely six months. I think, yeah, September 2020. Really? September 2020? Oh, yeah. So nine months now. Yep. That's okay. So I don't know if that says something about 2020 that I literally feel like it's been two years since I read this book or what it is. But like I I was I think I said before we record, it's been my favorite book of the last two years. <laughs> Did I say that? <laughs> that's so funny. Um, I think, that, I, I think yeah. that's such a that's such an interesting like the, the, the amount of novel things that happen stretches the perception of time. And I think that's like yeah. so, 2020 is the perfect example of that. There's just so much like, crazy stuff happening that it felt like five years, even though it was only one year. And all year, everybody was being like, oh my God, I can't believe that was three months ago. Well, you know, what's interesting about that is I have a friend, Heath, who said, um, you know how the people say like uh, time flies by when you're having fun? You know, that's like a kind of like a yeah. thing people say. So he was, and he's location dependent like myself and we've traveled together a little bit. And like, he was like, don't you feel like time passes slower because there's all of these things that we're doing. There's all of these places that we're going. And it's almost like at the end of the year, you look back and you're like, oh man, like I started the year in Mexico and then I went to Europe and then I did this thing and then I did that thing. And it almost feels like because there's so many things happening, it goes by slower when you look back at it. And I think maybe 2020 had a similar thing with it because there were just so many things that happened, you know, in one year. Yeah. I think that's what's, I remember Brian Chesky writing that. That's the first place I heard that idea. Um, and it mm. was like his case for travel and, and part of like what made him so excited about Airbnb is like the travel extends your perception of your life because yeah. it creates novelty and that novelty makes you feel like your time has been so much more full and gives that perception that, more has happened in the same amount of time or that that time was more full. Um, and so I think that's such a cool, like, you know, the nomads get to live a thousand lives, you know, rather than somebody who's like staying in the same place, making the same commute, doing the same work for, for 40 mm -hmm. years. Um, Where it just almost becomes like up. repetitive and the same thing over and over and over again. Yeah. Yeah. If you do the exact same thing for 40 years, like you've lived one day, not 40 years, um, mm. you spend, you know, 40 years in different countries, working on different projects with different people. Um, you know, there's, there's trade-offs, but there's also like, you just pack novelty into that, those years. And you feel like you had such a more full life in the same amount of time. Yeah. Interestingly on this topic as well, I recently finished a book, which hasn't happened in a while. Like I tend to start books, but I don't always end up finishing them. Interestingly, I finished the Almanac of the Vol, And then I finished this, this is the next book that I finished. It's called, um, a thousand miles in a, or a thousand years in a thousand miles or something by Dan Miller. Have you ever heard of it before? No. So he, uh, Dan Miller is an author. He's written a whole bunch of books, a lot about like storytelling and like branding and that kind of stuff. But this book was uh, recommended by Noah Kagan, if you know who Noah Kagan is. And one of the things that like, without going too deep into like what the book is about, he ends up like his memoir is they try to make it into a movie and the people who are making the movie are like, Hey, your life is kind of boring. We can't make this into a movie. And he goes this whole thing of like, why is my life boring? How do I make my life more exciting? And one of the things that he said was what makes things exciting and what makes us grow. And I'm paraphrasing here is like discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. When you become too comfortable, you become too complacent. You don't really try like, you know, what makes an interesting story interesting, the best movies are ones where somebody has to meet like a really big challenge. And mm -hmm. on a micro scale of that, I did think about that in terms of digital nomads or people who are traveling all the time is that every time you switch places, you're creating a little bit of discomfort in whatever yeah. way that may be, whether it's like, oh, I need to figure out how this Airbnb setup is and like how to make it as best for me or like where am I going to go work today because, you know, the Wi-Fi is kind of low. And even though that doesn't make you as productive as it can be, it does create a little bit of that discomfort that you need to get over all the time, you know? Yeah, I like that. Um, yeah, it, it is definitely not. I think the like optimizing for comfort is overrated. Yeah. Um, hmm. I think like, I think about this, there's kind of like the, the trilemma is like power, comfort and freedom. And like any move you make towards one of those sacrifices some of the other two along mm. at least one axis. Um, and so, you know, I imagine most 
of the digital nomads are like seeking freedom, right? Um, and to do that, you're giving up comfort and you're giving up power often um, and having to kind of create your own way and take on your own risk. Um, and you, you lose some of that, like, you know, maybe influence in your community because you're choosing a new community all the time and having to like find ways to fit into new places. Um, and I think that's like an interesting, uh, it's interesting to like look at those trade-offs and decisions through those things. Um, but to give up, to, to, to optimize for comfort is usually to give up freedom, uh, which I think people think that they want until they have it. And then they like end up unhappy and maybe aren't sure why. And they're like too yeah. comfortable. Yeah, there is, you can definitely make an argument about there being too much freedom isn't necessarily the best thing. Like I remember and people who listen to this podcast probably know the stories. Like in 2017, uh, I quit my job. I had done the digital nomad thing for a year. And then like everything just kind of came crashing around me, right? Like all the business that I was working on, all of a sudden my money dried up, everything just went to zero. And I remember being like really lost and I didn't know what to do next. And my mom, so I have an Eastern European background. My parents like grew up during the Soviet Union. And my mom told me, you know, growing up, we didn't have any options. You know, you didn't have the freedom to choose what to do. And in some way, there was some freedom in that because I didn't need to think about like, what are my passions and what I want to do? I just did what I had to do. Right. And she was like looking at me and she was like, I don't know how to help you because I've never had this experience of like, I can literally do anything. And how do you figure out how to get past that? And like, how do you decide what to go do? Yeah, there's huge discomfort that comes with that. It's funny, I was just thinking about this uh, this morning. Like we, we all have such, uh, our entertainment is so unique for us. Like our, our feeds and stuff are all mm. like very curated. And so we are all kind of confronted with like this freedom, this infinite crossroads of like, who do you wanna be and what do you wanna come? And so like, rather than being tied to a place or a family for your whole life, the way people were in previous generations, you're kind of forced to build your own new set of values and goals. And um, there's, you know, that's amazingly freeing in some ways, but it's, it's work um, mm -hmm. and it's hard. And I think, you know, if you aren't expecting it or expecting to put work into it or comfortable living through some of that ambiguity while you're like doing your seeking um that is you know that's a cause of a lot of like kind of maybe you know i don't know if clinical but like non-clinical depression or confusion or mm -hmm. anxiety um of just being like unsure when you have such infinite options like that's a blessing and a curse how do you as a creator manage this I guess like back and forth of like, there's all of these things, all these opportunities that I can create around, but then also creating, because I think what people can do is like, okay, there's a hundred topics that I'm curious about. There's a hundred things that I can write about. I can create courses. I can make, you know, there's just so many things. And I think yeah. the more opportunity there is, the harder it is to actually produce and to ship. So how do you in your life kind of make sure that you're not just, thinking about the opportunities, but you're actually creating and shipping. Yeah, I'm, I'm not the best person at this, probably like I kind of try to strike a middle ground between like, having a foot in a lot of things that I'm interested in, even if I'm not necessarily creating on them, um, and kind of trust that it's going to work out. But I do sometimes envy people who have like, one or two really, really clear focuses, and they know exactly like what their niche is, and they just stay in that niche. Um, I think it can work a lot of different ways. And I think I kind of trust the process of like following my curiosity and like it coming together eventually. Um, but there are definitely times when I like spend so much time thinking about what I could be doing that I am not doing enough. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I try to kind of like, I think that's like helpful and healthy to an extent, but not that can't be, you can't just be an idea guy, right? Like yeah. you got to get to work sometimes, um, even most of the time, but, uh, yeah, finding a balance between those two things is, is good. And I definitely, some of the mistakes that I have made are like getting too excited about an idea and working too hard on it before I've like, let it stew and vetted it a little bit. Um, and so I have like a hire fast, fire fast, like on ideas and I should learn to right. hire more slowly. Um, and it and leads to some projects that like get abandoned and like, that's just a thing I'm okay with. Um, even though it's not like the cleanest thing in the world for, you know, a brand or whatever, but like, that's, 
it comes more naturally to me. So I just kind of let it happen that way. Are you, would you say that, uh, I'm kind of just curious here. Are, do you, are you like a daydreamer? Like, do you catch yourself like daydreaming often? Yeah. So there's a study that I read that it was almost like it was very like close to home that talked about people who daydream often and they want to like whatever it is they're daydreaming about. Right. So like, let's say that somebody is like daydreaming about having a blog that they get to live off of and whatnot, that some people who are so strong in that skill set, meaning daydreaming, the brain ceases to tell the difference between what is the daydream and what's reality. And so you can actually lose the desire to go out there and create that thing because to you, like you're like in some way checking the box in your daydream. And I remember reading that and I was like, whoa, that's almost scary because there's definitely things that I've like daydreamed about before. And I've been like, eh, you know, like I don't really want to go down that path or whatever. Or like I don't have the hunger to do it as much as I would before. Yeah, I think that, so there's, there's two things that go with that. I think daydreaming about it gets you some of the dopamine of having accomplished it. I think telling people that you're going to do it also mm-hmm. gives you some of that dopamine and people are like, yeah. oh, wow, that's really cool. And so you're like, oh, I feel good about myself. Like I had a good idea. And it's like one tenth or one one hundredth of the like feeling of actual accomplishment. But, you know, one one thousandth or one one tenth and ten thousandth of the actual work. And so it's a mm-hmm. really easy trap to fall into. That it's just like feels good to talk about what you're going to do um, and get good feedback on that instead of what you already have done. And I actually have some creator like friends I admire who they do not talk about what they're building until they have built it. And there's a trade offs with that. Like that is not the build in public mindset. Um but they are keeping themselves like deeply accountable on a like neurochemical level of like, I will not reward myself by like mm. believing I have done this or telling people I have done this until I've done it. And I think that's an interesting thing to think about. Um, Did you tell people about what you were working on when you started working on the Naval book? Yeah, that was kind of built in public from the first. Like, oh, because it was a tweet in the beginning. <laughs> Yeah, like almost by accident. Um, And I'm really glad I did it that way. In retrospect, like I I got a lot of accountability out of that, Um, Mm -hmm. both both from like the fact that, you know, Naval saw that I said I would do it. And then a bunch of people were excited about it. (laughs) You can't fuck up in front of Naval, you know? (laughs) Yeah, I mean, like, it's a it is a unique opportunity. And so like my my bar was much higher than it would have been otherwise knowing Mm -hmm. kind of that, that it had eyes on it. And I never worried. Um, you know, a lot of people like say they're going to write a book and then quit and stop. And like, I was never worried that I wouldn't publish something. I was worried that like what I would publish wouldn't be good enough. Mm. And so it took longer than I thought it would. Um, but I was always like, I have to publish that. Like it is going to happen. Um, and so I worried more about the quality level and like just getting more and more iterations and more and more work into it. Um, than I did about like, Oh, will I ever like be able to publish it? Um, like that was kind of a given. Just right. because it was in public. Um, so there's definitely like pros and cons on both sides of the like the build in public situation. So give me and people listening a little bit more of a background of you. Like, how did you? I'm assuming you didn't just pop up one day on the Twitter sphere and get to, you know, t- tweet at Naval and all these kind of things. What were you doing at the time, you know, when? all of that kind of spiraled into what it is now? Like, what, what were you doing? What is your background in? So on and so forth. Yeah, I, um, so I've kind of always been a like, slightly ADD, like side hustler person. Like, I don't, I don't love like side hustle as a term, but like, I was the kid selling candy out of my locker and like, getting paid to give kids rides like to school and to practice. Mm-hmm. And like, in college i had like some kind of typical like college kid businesses like building websites and importing you know t-shirts and uh stuff like that so um there's always been a little bit of like you know entrepreneurialism and and projects and stuff like that um i joined twitter in probably 2008 or 9 um so you know it has been a long kind of slow linear-ish growth that that has just kind of always been my like you know it's just like my living room like when back then in twitter it was just kind of like a local organizing tool almost like you'd go on mm-hmm. there and people were like it was all people who either knew each other or had just met or whatever um and like 
hanging out and getting together. Um, so I, I feel lucky to have like kind of been in that ecosystem almost accidentally and like grown up with that. Um, and that has grown as I have done different projects. So probably the other biggest um, project was a blog called Evergreen. Mm -hmm. And that was really, uh, that was like 2014, 15. And I would publish a weekly post that was a curation around one specific business idea. And so I would say like, okay, this week I'm going to study network effects. Everybody send me the best thing you've ever seen, watched, read, listened to whatever about network effects. And I will take it all in, synthesize it, pull out the most important points and write like a 10 minute kind of like 101 post that links back to all the original material. So if you want to spend 10 minutes learning about like the overview of this idea, if you're new to it, um, you can do that. If you want to spend a few hours and dive into all these, you know, the best of the couple dozen resources that were sent to me, you can do that too. Um, so in many ways, sorry to interrupt you here, but yeah. what you were doing with Evergreen was almost in a way, perfect practice for what you ended up doing for the Naval book. Yeah. I mean, the skill sets of like one audience building two being a digital hoarder and three, like curating and sort of synthesizing things. Um, you know, it's something I do kind of naturally, like I do versions of this that I never publish. I just am like curious and learning and always trying to like find great resources and understand them and relate them to the other things that I've known. Um, and that was the process of that blog. That's the process of this book. Um, you know, that's the process of like a great podcast is like, mm -hmm. you know, having a conversation and filtering through all the other stuff that you know and finding like, helpful and interesting stories and ideas and connecting all those dots. Like that's super fun for me. I love, I love the term digital hoarder. That's so <laughs> nice. How do you, I so, I so resonate with that, but I think I'm the, not sure the, I love it, but it's definitely descriptive of me. Oh no, it's great. We're putting it out there. This is, you know, let's make it a thing. Digital hoarder. I love it. But the thing about being a digital hoarder, which I so resonate with that is I feel like there's so many good things that I've taken in so many things I've taken down notes about so many, like, you know, whatever. And I find it difficult to put some sort of framework to my hoarding in order to then be able to call it back. Right. Because there's no yeah. point in hoarding all of these great stuff. If you can't in some way use it or call it back and with, you know, your experience on evergreen and your experience within the vol book where it's like literally calling back all of these things like how do you do that like how do you make it easy for you to go out there and find the information that you've before earmarked so to say yeah i i'm sure that there is a beautiful system to this um that may be closer to like the building a second brain process like i've never mm -hmm. taken that course i don't know that that, that may be like by tiago forte yeah 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 that may be like a better system my my like system is very it just involves like spending time with the material. Like I'm not trying to automate things so that mm -hmm. I don't have to think about how they're organized. Um, I try to like, the more you marinate in it, like the more it kind of seeps in. Um, and so the, the interesting thing about doing this book was like, it's like doing a giant kind of conceptual jigsaw puzzle. Like you have to find, you find a piece and you're kind of like, you know, try to understand it and look at its edges and then like figure out where it relates to the other things that you have already put together and find the right kind of thread of question and answer and curiosity and ideas that follows through. Um, so that as you're reading, it feels like a very natural progression of ideas. Mm -hmm. um, and so when you see an idea and you're like either, you know, how or why or what, um, like you get that, that next puzzle piece is exactly where it needs to be for the reader to kind of continue to build those ideas out and, and get their understanding like as deep as they can. Um, and is this kind of the same with, with other things? So like when I'm hoarding, like when I find something great, I usually have, um, I have these like giant Google docs, uh, which is like the least sophisticated thing, but I have like, I have one for growth and one for products. And, um, when I was writing evergreen, you know, each of those were like their own posts. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I tag stuff in pocket when I get there pockets great, just cause it's so searchable. Um, but I like pull excerpts and link backs into this Google doc and then just use like headings as automatic kind of like links and organization and just try to build this like logical hierarchy of ideas. Um, it's very searchable and then like backlinks to original sources. If you want the context around a particular excerpt. So it's really, you know, when I'm like, I'm uh, working with a tech stars cohort right now. And so they have like questions about growth and they're like, okay, here's where I am. Here's my stage. I'll kind of like open up my Google doc. And I'm like, okay, you're in this like 
figure out your unit economics stage, which is like, you know, in my head, like chapter three of the growth, like progression thing. It's like, okay, let's figure out your unit economics and see if we can proceed to the next, like optimizing marketing spend chunk, mm -hmm. like, you know, um, so, it's, but it's hard to short for me, at least it's hard to shortcut that time spent with the material. Um, and so even though it kind of seems low leverage, like you're just like, you are building that, um, fluency with it. And so you know where it is and where to find it and when it applies. Uh, and so I think that ends up being really helpful, uh, uh, over time as you kind of like reference those files in your head more and more and more. Mm -hmm. You mentioned tech stars, right? So what do you do on a, I know that you did the book. I'm assuming it's not like your main thing or like your main earner. What do you do for like a, a living when you're not diving into Naval's brain, uh, and creating a book out of it? <laughs> Uh, I've been, I was at a startup for the last like 10 years, um, that just got acquired. And so I'm like between, between companies at the moment, um, which is great. Cause I got a ton of random projects to kind of work on. And I'm just doing a little like mentorship and residence thing with tech stars for a minute, uh, which is really mm -hmm. fun. Cause I'm kind of like, we're just trying to get like reoriented to the space. Like, you know, you joined a company 10 years ago and now like a lot has changed kind of like, okay, let's do like, a big 10 the technology years. out there. Yeah, it's been a big 10 years. Um, so I've been spending a lot more time reading and meeting people and meeting new companies and, um, you know, doing podcasts and working on projects mm -hmm. that have kind of been on the back burner for a long time. And, um, you know, taking some time this summer and, uh, we'll see what's next. Another company probably, but, uh, much, much too soon to tell. So there's a word that has already gotten thrown around quite a bit in this conversation. And I expect that it's going to get thrown around quite a bit more as we go in deeper on this. And that's leverage. And for me, the book, uh, you know, the Almanac of Naval, by the way, the Navalmanac, Navalmanac is killer. That's such a good name. Um, but for me, that was like the really big takeaway when I yeah. closed the book and I was like, Okay, what's the one thing that I haven't really thought about? What's the one thing that I haven't really internalized as much? And like, I get the wealth stuff. I get the happiness stuff. Like a lot of that has been around for quite a bit more. But leverage for me was something that I understood as a, as a thing. Mm -hmm. But I never really stopped to think about it in the way that Naval talks about it, right? So he says that there's like three different types of leverage, right? You have, and correct me if I'm wrong, uh, money leverage, people leverage, and then like technological leverage, right? Yeah, there's kind of a ton of different like classifications floating around. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think Naval's would like code, media, and cap, or no, his was labor, product, capital. and capital. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so one of the quick things here that I just kind of like realized when I was preparing for this interview was talk about the macro of leverage that he had someone else write his book for him. Yes. Did this you think is, about is, that? Yeah. 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 As I was studying it, I was like, yep, this checks out. This is like, yeah. uh, this is like high, very high leverage for him. Um, you, you got and, leveraged. Yeah. yeah. And works for me. Like, so, so this is like a, this is a misconception about leverage, I think, because, so there's, there's like two existing or uh, non-mental model like definitions of leverage. And mm -hmm. one is like basically financial, like Wall Street slang for debt. And the other yep. is like to have power over somebody in a negotiation, right? And so the first mm. time someone hears leverage, if they're kind of not familiar with either like Naval or the mental model, or, you know, some of these things that have been floating around our little world, uh, is, is they have this like negative connotation. Like um, there's a winner or a loser. Yeah, that there's a winner or loser rather than this like, it, we are all someone else's leverage, right? Like to have an amazing product is to create leverage for someone else or to be an amazing service provider is to create leverage for someone mm. else. Um, if you are creating leverage for your customers, like you'll be a valuable asset to them and and vice versa. So there is, we are all someone else's leverage and there is no like, <laughs> was I happy to like be leveraged for Naval and like write a book about him that like benefited him and benefited me and benefited readers? Like, of course I was. Like that was right that was magic. Um, it, it, that was like this little like piece of alchemy. And, and that's what I think leverage does at its best. Right. Um, is like, it, it is like the art of accomplishing more. Um, mm. and we are all helping each other to accomplish more all the time. One can listen to this podcast and understand, you know, a new idea or find a new tool, a new product that helps them. Like we have been leveraged for them and that's wonderful. Um, 
you know, we, you are helping me like share ideas right now. We're spending, you know, an hour or two together, but in the future, someone else is going to be able to listen to this, you know, thousands or tens of thousands of times, like years into the future and get value out of that. And so like zoom is leveraged for us right now. And, you know, this microphone is leveraged for us right now. Everything is going to, you know, we, we can see all of what we do through this lens. Mm. What I, and like going back to this like idea of like, I think it's easy to understand, but it's far more difficult to actually like implement. So how does somebody take this idea of leverage or at least the way that Naval talks about it and kind of, I, I think it's people understand easily capital and labor, right? Like if I take on money, then I'm getting that leverage to be able to purchase like whatever I need for my startup. If I hire people, I get that. For me, what's really more interesting is like that third piece of leverage, that product, the media, right? The coding, because to me, that's kind of like, that's interesting. That's not quite so figured out yet. So what do you, what are some of the ways that people listening can employ that third type of leverage? Yeah. L- let me, um, let me back up to like the beginning of the mental model, I think. Mm-hmm. Um, so we kind of said what it's not. And then I just yelled leverage a bunch of times, which is not that helpful. Um, so, so let me go, let me go back to zero, start from the beginning of the mental model and try to try to build up and end an application. Sure. So um, a lever is a simple machine in physics that basically allows you to lift or move like something much heavier than you could directly. So if you have you know, a 20 foot lever arm and a fulcrum, like um, the, the average person could lift like an 800 pound weight with a, with a 20 foot lever. Mm-hmm. Um, if you have like a 20 mile long lever in theory, you could lift like the Eiffel tower. Um, mm-hmm. and so leverage as a mental model, as we're talking about it is finding ways to increase your output for the amount of effort that you expend. And so how does like a mere mortal you know, earn $10 million a year or reach a million people mm-hmm. or, um, you know, th- like these, these kind of seemingly superhuman accomplishments that we see all the time and this disparity of outcomes that we see all the time is explainable through this lens of leverage. Uh, my kind of, I, I tried to reclassify um, Naval's buckets a little bit um, as I kind of kept exploring these ideas. And so to me, there, there are four types of leverage tools, product, people, and capital. So there's some overlap with, with what Naval has said. Um, but I think tools is an important thing because, you know, it's really hard to cut down trees, with your bare hands, it's much easier right. with an ax, but a lumberjack with a chainsaw is going to be significantly more productive than somebody with an ax and somebody with a tractor is going to be even more productive than that. And so you can accomplish more through the application of mm-hmm. tools. Um, product is, is a product of your mind. So s- distinct from tools, it's something, it's a way that you can sort of capture your judgment or your expertise or your experience, whether that's in code or in media. Um, and the thing that Naval points out about the product leverage, um, is that it's near uh, zero marginal costs of replication, right. which has really only happened in the digital era. It's so got it scale. used to be that like, yeah, a book was a product, right? Like the printing mm-hmm. press was a huge inflection point in the leverage inherent in a product because you could write a book and then the printing press could help you reach many, many more people. A blog or a website or a podcast or a software program now has decreased that marginal cost of replication and now that we're all sort of interconnected, the market for some of those digital products is like pretty close to truly global, or at least like limited to the language that you wrote it in. Um, and so these extreme, extreme outcomes, um, especially in like the crypto world, where it is truly like one global market, um, like Uniswap is like one software program and it's earning like tens of millions of dollars maybe per day now. Um, mm-hmm. Like it's, it's absolutely wild, but that is the is it the program that is executing a set of rules that is has no marginal cost to replication. So it costs are incredibly low, values incredibly high, and it just you know, keeps going and going and going and going. Um, the third bucket is people leverage, um, and so I use people instead of labor um, because I want to generalize beyond like an employee employer relationship and include things like fans, audiences. Um, communities, family, friends, 
um, you know, some of the, and stuff like task-based work or um, agencies, right? Like these are all f ways to use, um, not not in a like hierarchical way, but to like employ people and give them work and access their skill sets or their experience or their expertise. Um, and then of course, the, of course, the fourth is is capital, which can take a lot of different forms, um, and is usually there's like a capital cycle, and so like your application of the first three buckets earns you some capital that you can then reinvest into higher margin or more robust forms of the first three buckets of leverage, mm -hmm. um, or you can use capital itself. Um, kind of the goal of all of this, like the fundamental denominator, is like your time and your energy, and so um, the the Part of this whole thing is figuring out how to use uh, what's available to you in each of those four different buckets to increase your output or your results per amount of time that you work. Um, a so, really interesting, like just a quick point here that I keep yeah. thinking about as you're saying this is um, I was listening to an interview with Anthony Pompliano, who I think you've been on his podcast, correct? Yeah. Yep. And it was so interesting because he was talking about the fact that he spends a majority of his day on Twitter uh, because to him, that is the largest leverage that he has, right? He has so many followers and he has so much, he can like, he can have so much impact with a single tweet that to mm -hmm. him, the best time, like spending time on Twitter is the best way for him to spend his time, which is so interesting because for most people, that is the worst place to spend their time. So it really comes down to like, how big is that lever? And a lot of people are spending time on like a small lever as opposed to wherever their big lever is. Yeah. So I think there's there's definitely two ways to look at that. Like one, like he has a huge lever there. I think he's almost to a million followers, right? So like obviously that is a high leverage use of his time is like, mm -hmm. you know, talking to that many people at once. Um, but he didn't, he wasn't born there, right? So he spent a long time very deliberately building that lever. And so what we kind of look at, you know, in this, this course and this community that I'm putting together is like, what is the work that you do that gets more work done? How can mm. you be sure that you're spending your days, like not just using the levers that you have, but building new levers and extending the length of the levers that you have so that, you know, in a month, a year, five years, you know, that one hour of work that you do is going to have 10 X or a hundred X the result. Um, and so when you look at, I mean, Pop is a, a great example, right? Like 10 years ago, he could tweet whatever he wanted and like, it was irrelevant. Um, yeah. Didn't earn him anything, didn't reach anybody. Um, you know, now he's got a podcast and an email subscription. And I mean, I'm sure he's earning somewhere in the seven figures per year because he very deliberately built those levers. And so now when he does, he records one podcast, takes the same amount of time to record his 500th podcast as it did to record his first podcast. But the results for him in terms of reach and revenue and like is, is 10x, 100x, maybe 1000x by now, um, what that first podcast was. And it's because he very deliberately built leverage um, and he's using sort of the people leverage in the form of an audience, um, the product leverage in the form of, of podcasts and emails and Twitter. Uh, and I'm sure there's a whole suite of tools around him and, and probably people that help him publish at the rate that he does, you know, so he's probably got a, a podcast editor and, um, you know, maybe a, an assistant or an intern that's helping schedule or something uh, and just like run this machine that he's created. Yeah. And I think uh, like leverage is easy to spot when it's in a big scenario, right? So mm -hmm. like Tim Ferriss, who has, you know, wrote the foreword for the book and all these things, like has an immense amount of levers to where I've heard him talk about before that, like he doesn't invest in companies that he doesn't think he can have like a massive impact on himself, right? Because mm -hmm. he has an audience, he knows what audience is into. And if he invests in a company that that audience is primed for, then it's really easy for him to like, essentially like drive more worth into that company. And I think where this becomes difficult is people listening may be thinking, okay, I get this on a big scale. I get how mm -hmm. this works for Pompliano for that Twitter example, but how does somebody who's listening to this, who doesn't have that scale, how do they use leverage every day? Yeah. So I think this, it's a great question and it's a good place to start because I think, um, one of the common hangups is it, it's almost the same as, as compounding. Like I relate the, the mental model of compounding to leverage a lot because they're both kind mm. of like mathematically sound uh, things that are counterintuitively powerful, but they start really small. 
And and when you first say like, you want me to invest a hundred dollars so that I earn like five dollars, like that's irrelevant. Um, but when you chart out the results of long term compounding, it seems like absolutely useless for the first few years that you're doing it. Um, but by the by year ten or year twenty or year fifty, it seems impossible that that ever comes true, right? Um, and so I think the first thing to to think about for people who you know, see this big gap between like them and the obvious, you know, high leverage sort of people are like, understand that it took them a long time to get there. And that like results are going to come small at first. But if you stick to the playbook, and you, you keep reinvesting, you're going to get longer and longer levers and more and more levers. And as long as you keep following that cycle, you will end up somewhere that seems absolutely impossible today. Um, example wise, I, actually, this morning, I was listening to your podcast li with Luis Croft. Um, and I was like, really, I really love her story. And I think she kind of has nailed this like leveraged, she calls it passive income, but I think it's mm -hmm. leveraged income, right? So like her business um, is to go find people who have great skills and insights and she partners with them to build their courses. So she knows how to build a course, even though she might not know the subject that this person is teaching. Um, and she works for a fixed period of time to build this asset, um, this course, and then puts it on Udemy. And then there's this kind of like long tail of income that comes from that, that she shares with that person. So she brings no capital, but she brings her expertise and experience and she spends time creating a product, right? Like that course is a product of that other person's mind and experience and expertise, and then uses Udemy as the distribution leverage. Um, so I didn't want to confuse the first one, but like I have a secret bucket number five that is like vendors and platforms are like mm -hmm. bundles of leverage, right? So Udemy uses tools and people and product and capital that, to build their own business. But like Udemy is your marketing engine. Like once she puts something on Udemy, Udemy sells it for her. And so she can focus on building the next lever. And so every new course she adds is a new income stream for her. And she just keeps building and building and building and building. Um, and I think her story is really interesting because she has such a good, like started from nothing. Now we hear moment, you know? Yeah. Um, and like, that's a great example of like seemed irrelevant maybe for the first step, but once you've been through it a few times, like she's in a great spot, she's got a wonderful business. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's almost like and this is like a maybe a trend that you've spotted, but I'm just now spotting is, and I even wrote down here, compound equals leverage. Yeah. Because have you noticed that? So, I mean, obviously, I think one of the, you have the almanac of Naval, and then you have poor Charlie's almanac, right? Which is like Charlie Munger's book. And everything in that is all about finances and about compounding. If you talk to anybody who's in their like 50s or 60s, the thing they always talk about is like invest, 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 because compounding interest pays off later down the road. Is leverage the new compounding interest where maybe 30, 40 years from now, we're going to be telling our kids, hey, like figure out your leverage, figure out your leverage? I, I think it could be. Like compounding is a it kind of fits within that framework, right? Like mm -hmm. in the sense that like capital can earn on your behalf through compounding and the compounding, like compounding is just like a matter of reinvesting profits, mm -hmm. right? Like the, the, that's the heart of it. Um, and so when you are reinvesting in building leverage, the gap between like what you could accomplish, I've, I've got this in a graphic um, somewhere that maybe we can link to, but I think seeing sure. it in a chart, there's like working without le leverage is perfectly linear. You know, you can do the same job without leverage for a very long time and earn basically the same thing. You can work with leverage and that increases your slope over time so that you're increasing your earnings over time. And then you can work while reinvesting in leverage and like that's where things go exponential. And so that's, there, there is very different paths there, um, but that's where can the compounding piece comes in. Can you explain that a little bit more? What is like, give us an example of, com of investing in leverage. Yeah. So reinvesting in, so like there's different forms of, you know, each of those buckets has a ton of different options in there. Right. Um, and the process of reinvesting in leverage is just taking the, you know, the profits that you get from whatever you're doing and reinvesting into tools, 
products, people, and capital that help you accomplish even more, mm. right? So if you if you recorded just a hundred podcasts and then stopped, you would get some benefit from those podcasts. But every podcast you do between 101 and number 1,000 is going to add value, not is going to grow your audience, and it's going to benefit those first 100 podcasts in terms of listenership and following. And so each step that you take there adds more and more. Um, you know, this is this is maybe easier to uh, grok in like the agency world. So let's take an agency as an example. Um, there's plenty of people out there who like make a great living as a consultant. Mm -hmm. like one-to-one -one linear relationship between their time and their money. You know, they, they have a high hourly rate. They got to go find clients, but they bill them and they have a wonderful life. And then there's consultants who maybe make the leap to like, yeah, I consult, but I also use some of those profits to build products or to build audience and then to sell courses that like scale some of my knowledge a little bit more. And so those people are building leverage um, and maybe they can increase their price and maybe, you know, for their hourly rate, maybe they increase their earnings. And then there's people who are reinvesting in leverage and they make the leap maybe from consultancy to agency or consultancy to, uh, scalable like software products. Um, and Nathan Barry has a great post. Uh, we actually just talked about this in his podcast. Uh, but he has a great post called ladders of wealth creation. And you can mm -hmm. see, like, I look at that and see people who are very deliberately reinvesting in leverage and forms of leverage that have um, that have more uncapped, better sort of uh, higher profit margin. Like there's there's businesses that are just like very fixed profit margin and very linear outcomes um, related to your time. And the people who are reinvesting in leverage are breaking free of that relationship and building businesses that are much more uncapped. Um, and have much higher outcomes and have much higher margins, but it it increases in complexity and usually increases in some risk. Um, and so you've got to be, you know, it, it makes sense to go somewhat step by step there, which which Nathan lays out amazingly in this post. I almost think, you know, returning to this idea of compound equals leverage, and they kind of like you know run along the same track, so to say, or at least on parallel tracks. The wealth gap is obviously something that gets talked about a lot in the news, and it's a big problem. And the fact that the rich are very, very rich and the poor are getting poorer and poorer and poorer. And perhaps this was somewhere in the book. Um, I'm, I'm not maybe sure where it is, but it's almost like for me, um, the bigger problem in the future won't be the wealth gap. I think the bigger problem in the future will be the leverage gap, right? Because people are yeah. going to be becoming more and more and more leveraged and people who can't figure that out are going to get left behind. So this is kind of like two questions in one, which I know is a podcast you should never do, but I break <laughs> the rules. One, how can people make sure that they end up on the right side of that, right? Where they end up becoming the leveraged people. And then what can we as, I don't know, a society, we as a generation perhaps do to not, make the mistake of the wealth gap and instead find a way to like make sure that everyone becomes leveraged together as opposed to like, you know, there being a gap in that. Yeah. It's a very, um, Naval has a great quote about this in the book I, that is like, forget blue collar versus white rich versus poor. Mm. Like the future is about leverage versus unleveraged. Yeah. Um, and I, I mean, I think we've, we are set up for some success here in that, like, so much more information is open and available and it's so much more of kind of a market meritocracy than it has been before um you know this podcast is available for free if anybody wants to go learn about leverage they can um i think the the challenge is maybe even upstream of that is to like show make people aware of the value of it over the long over the long haul right um in the same way that like people who really grok compounding um, make it a priority to invest and end up in a place that's like a little more, you know, safe and comfortable for retirement, um, or tend to have a bigger savings buffer or things like that. And I think, I think leverage kind of has the same power to change lives. If it can, if people can change the mindset and learn to kind of like work in that way. Um, and I'm pretty optimistic about the, like, I think almost every career or skill set or interests can take a leveraged form. You know, I don't think there's, um, I don't think there's people who like, if you would want to really want to be a teacher, 
you're doomed to live an unleveraged life just because of how the school system employment is set up. You know, um, you can teach online, you can like, you know, like Khan Academy and Udemy, and there's so many educational tools for this. Um, and there's paths, you know, from in most industries from entry level to ownership or, or managership or equity ownership. Um, and that's one of the things that Naval emphasizes is like, people who get rich tend to get rich by owning equity in a business. Mm -hmm. um, and there's a lot of people that don't, that are never exposed to that idea um, or understand that that's where some of the, that like disparity of outcome comes from. Um, and so I think like the more people understand that, the better and the more you can help bring along like the people in your life and in your community and share that, you know, open secret as publicly as you can, like benefits everybody. Um, and I think the web will continue to make that more, hopefully more and more democratized. Um, we're seeing a ton of tools and uh, ideas that share and support that um, over time. And so I think there's a real like cause for optimism. Yeah, I think like just this rise of simple to use automation over the last, like, I don't know. I mean, like Zapier has been around for a while, mm -hmm. but it I've really felt it's power kind of increase in the last couple of years where I'm like, oh, like this is like something that you can, I mean, I've heard of people whose entire businesses are just one yeah. long like zap, right? And it's, that's yeah. incredible. The fact that one person can like automate their wealth, like literally automate like money coming in, right? And I think that that's a very kind of um, one level understanding of like, you know, leverage and how applied on a business, it can like really multiply things. Yeah. Um, we got I'm some curious. studies about that in the in the course. Uh, so like my buddy Tom Osman has like some amazing. He shows like this uh, little um, automation that he put together that automates like half of the work of a recruiter. And so like a recruiter who does that can do their job in like half the time, um, or do it twice as effectively. And there's another uh, there's another friend who exactly as you're describing, he has like basically automated his business. He has a 21 step zap that does like everything that he used to have to do manually. And he's like, I truly do not know what to do all day anymore. Like my business just runs through Zapier and Zapier or whatever. And like, it's kind of magic, but also I'm kind of bored now. So I gotta go find something else to do. He's bored until one tiny step and that zap breaks. And then he needs to go figure out exactly where in that 21 step <laughs> yeah. process. He's either bored or very break. stressed. That's yeah. it, yeah, that's his life. Um, tell us a little bit about, since we're, you know, mentioned the course, tell us a little bit about the course and, what it's all about and how exactly do you teach leverage? Because I think that's like the difficult thing that we keep coming around on around leverage is it's kind of like this thing that you, it's like smoke, right? Like, you know, that is there, you can see that it's there, but it's kind of hard to grasp. So, uh, and like grab and kind of grab a hold of it. So what, um, what is the course about and how exactly do you teach people about leverage and what is your end goal? Like, what do you, what can somebody who's coming into that course expect to end up on the other side. Yeah, so I think I love online courses and so it's been really, really fun to kind of build one. Um, I also have spent most of my life reading about mental models. Um, and so I, the, the kind of complaint or critique or opportunity, I guess, that I have seen for a really long time is like work that takes these ideas, these mental models and takes them from idea to application. Um, you know, it's really easy to read about them. It is very hard to close that gap between like, oh, this is a good idea. And like, I know how to apply this in my life and I'm actively doing it. So that's really the, the focus of this course is to take this leverage idea that we've been talking about and help all of our kind of members like close this gap between taking active steps in their life mm. and, and feeling what that cycle of reinvesting in leverage that we talked about is learning to like see the world through this lens one um, and then understanding like the motions and building the instincts to like choose the leveraged path or the leverage option when presented an opportunity or a challenge or um, a crossroads. And so the way that we do that, um, there's kind of a few like components of the course. Um, first, obviously there's like, you know, reading and watching and listening to do. And the first kind of chunk of the course is really like, Let's introduce you to this mental model as thoroughly as we can. Um, let's try to give you enough information so that you can kind of 
add your own examples to your mental file. So as you're walking around and you see, you know, a new influencer or a new business or a new whatever, you're, you're almost instinctively kind of like breaking down their leverage and figuring out how they are accomplishing what they are. Mm. And once you're in a place where you can build your own mental library, it becomes much easier to apply this. And so once we get to application, there's a few um, kind of frameworks that we have, worksheets and frameworks, and some are at the like individual solution level, and some are at the like, your an overview of your personal leverage and so we call we call the course building a mountain of levers right like i want for you in a few years to feel like you're sitting atop this mountain that you built of a bunch of different levers and like when you reach out and push one lever you're able to like move a heavy rock you know mm -hmm. like 100 meters away and when you spend the same hour of effort recording a podcast or writing a post or building a product you're output for that effort is rewarded 10x or 100x and that you're continuing to be able to build and grow that. And so one of the, the kind of core tools that we use built based on that metaphor is like this map of this leverage map. And so something that people are doing like every month or every quarter is kind of inventory, like a top down look at their leverage. What do they have now? Where are they trying to get and what is the what's available sort of within arm's reach for the next step for them? Um, and then where are they trying to go in six months or a year? And so every step that they take is kind of building towards that long-term vision. But it's amazing when you chart that out, how often their kind of biggest current resources are not deployed against the biggest challenge or opportunity that they have. Mm. Um, and almost everybody has, you know, of those four buckets, tools, product, people, and capital, there's almost always one or two that everyone is really gifted at. You know, I have developer friends and, and uh, members in the course who are like, I can use any tool at any time and I can record any, like, uh, I can build any product in software, but like, I know I need people leverage, but I don't know how, and I have a mental blocker about it. And I don't even think about capital as leverage. And so there's usually one that they're focused on, but don't know how to access. And then mm -hmm. there's usually one that they're totally blind to. Um, you know, some people just don't think of media as leverage. Some people don't think of ways to access people um but they or or they do but they don't have a they they have like a psychological blocker about hiring somebody or something like that um so working through some of those things and just like getting that, that overview and just you know getting the instinct in the cycle to go through and go through this motion of like let me chart everything let me inventory my opportunities let me solve these problems in leveraged ways um and then there's the, this community on top of this course. So we go we go into detail in all of these buckets and a bunch of different examples. And we kind of create these memorable metaphors for people to um, make these things instinctive. And there's a lot, there's a, like a very healthy appendix with like, uh, it's kind of the edge of the semantic tree that like not everybody's gonna be interested in every piece of it. But like, if you have a question, like the answer's in there somewhere. Um, and then there's this great community component where everyone is kind of sharing what they're doing and the tools that they're finding and the opportunities that they're creating. And we do case studies with members where, you know, like walking, walk me through that 21 steps. Mm -hmm. How did you automate this business? And for people who have spent most of their career building an agency and building people leverage, they're kind of like, holy shit, I didn't even know that was a thing I could do. Like I'm hiring a no code agency immediately. And like increasing the leverage of all of my employees and like that'll increase my total output and like that's wonderful mm -hmm. um so this cross-pollination that comes from when people all over the world with different skill sets um are the, the course really gives them a common language and a common framework to then share their experience and their expertise and their ideas and skills with each other so that they can all kind of help each other shore up their mountains and like build it all together um and it's really, really rewarding to kind of see it come together. And I think in a few years, we're going to have like a really, you know, a community of some thousands and a really robust library of these case studies. Um, and I very deliberately create like kind of, there's the community broadly, and then there's these small study groups of like five to eight people that are meeting continuously. And so they have built context with each other and built relationships and kind of hold each other accountable. Um, and that's a really good kind of like core community. And that's a, a nice step between like, hey, it's just me studying this material and trying to apply it versus like, I have people to talk about this with, but mm -hmm. I don't wanna share all of this super publicly with the community. And then there's like the broader community where people can match each other and find each other and um, access the skills of others and, and uh, experience of others.
where can people find out if, you know, they're listening and they're like, this sounds awesome. I need to dive into this. So where can people find out and, uh, you know, check out the course? Oh yeah. Uh, so ejorgensen.com slash leverage. Uh, so that's my personal site. Um, slash leverage is like the course page. Um, and I, sh- I talk about leverage a ton on Twitter. Um, like my, my pinned thread is, uh, or my pinned tweet is like a thread of all my leverage threads and more information about the course as things get built out. And, um, yeah, it's a, it's a, been a really fun project. And everybody that I talk to about this, like teaches me something new about it. And they've all did us a great favor by kind of like labeling this mm-hmm. concept as such. And like, but there's so much more to explore. And I've heard from so many people who read the book, like leverage is my main takeaway, but I don't know what to do about it. Like I love yeah. this idea and I feel its power, but I don't know how to use it. Um, which is exactly like what led me down this kind of course and community path and keep to keep studying this idea. And it's where I am in my life too. So um, I feel like, you know, I'm, I'm trying to learn it and apply it alongside everybody else, but create a common language and, mm-hmm. uh, you know, bring, bring everybody along and we're all kind of learning from each other in there. You mentioned this image of having a mountain of levers that you sit on top of. And I, I love that. Um, I love that sort of like image, but I'm curious, what are your, when you think about your own mountain of levers, what are like your personal top three levers, whether I'll let you choose what that means, whether it's like your most powerful ones or the ones that you use kind of most often. Yeah. I mean, I, I spend a lot of time on Twitter. Um, I don't have like the world's biggest following, but uh, I think that's back to like the, the ADD that I have a little bit. I just like treat it like a giant living room and I'm just kind of myself on there rather than working really hard to build a super precise brand or anything. Um, I, I think these like podcasts like this go a really long way. Um, I love podcasts as a way to kind of get to know people. And I think it's so mm-hmm. much, it's so much deeper than just reading something that someone else has written. Um, when they're kind of speaking off the cuff, it feels much more genuine and you get a better sense of, of who they are than something that's been written and, and carefully edited or something like that. Um, I also think there's something about hearing the person's voice. Like I've talked about this yeah. before, where when you read something, you get to understand somebody's ideas. You get to read their ideas. When you listen to a podcast, you get to understand their ideas and hear it from their voice. And for me, video wins because not only do you get the previous two, but you also get to see the person. And I think in that there's something about us seeing the way a person is and their mannerisms that make them a lot more relatable or real, or I don't really know what it is, but it's almost like a hierarchy of like content, right? Yeah. Yeah. I think that's, um, I think it's a really underrated thing. Um, and I mean, I, I think also the, I mean, the book is a huge piece of leverage. I like Mm -hmm. it. It took a long time to build. Um, you know, I was working on that for, for years. Uh, but it's, you know, now that it is built, um, you know, it's a, it's a product and, you know, I don't, I don't believe in passive income, but I believe in leveraged income. Um, and that is a lever that has been built that has given me a lot of, um, I don't know, it's given me a lot of freedom and, uh, there's something like arbitrage around a book that's like I've written many books worth of content online, but it mm-hmm. does not carry the same sort of um, weight. Yeah, the same weight. Which, um, on the one hand, the book is way harder to way harder to make and get across the finish line, and involves like much more investment and much more curation and much more effort. Um, but it is kind of weird to think about, like, as yeah, the actual I think- content. And I think Ramit said he had an interesting quote about this where he said, like, you know, everything that I've written, because he has a book, I don't know if you're familiar with him, called I Would Teach You to Be Rich, which I think personally mm-hmm. is the worst title of a book ever. But he's got it's an it's an amazing book and it's my go to for like personal finance. and I recommend it all the time. But he, he, one of the things that he said once that I thought was interesting was, he, was um, he said, everything that I have in this book, you can learn by reading my blog. But the reason why the book is so important is that it's taken all of it together and I've given it to you. And for like $7.99 or whatever it is, you can pay that amount of money and you don't need to scroll through pages and pages and pages of blog posts. You can just read it. And it's almost like you're paying for the curation and the curation. And I'm trying to find like the other word, like kind of piecing it together. And it's almost, that's what you did with Naval, right? Is like 
all yeah. of the stuff that he said is out there and you can go out there and technically parse through it and read all of his tweets and try to do all of that. But what you did was you put it all together and you like synthesized it into like, here it is, right? Yeah. And I think the other, the other piece of that is that especially Naval, most of Naval's creations have been podcasts and Twitter. Mm -hmm. he's not, he's not, he has a blog, but he's not like as big of a blogger as like Ramit was. Um, right. But the, it's weird to think about like podcasting and Twitter are so like subcultures, like compared to, compared to books for sure. Um, and there's people that like, if they're not a podcast person, if you send them a podcast, like they don't even know what to they do. They don't know what to it. do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, or they're not a Twitter person. They kind of like read the tweet that you sent them and they're like, okay. Um, but it, there's definitely rabbit holes in both of those. And the, I, I think the other piece of the Navalmanac that is just like, it has opened up Naval's ideas to all of these people who are not in neither of those subcultures or the startup world who had maybe never heard of him before, mm -hmm. but appreciate and can find life-changing value in some of those ideas. Yeah. I think you're so on point about the podcasting thing, because it's a thing like, you know, podcasters know the best way to get new listeners is to go on other podcasts, because mm -hmm. I don't think it's so much technological. Like, it's not like if I send somebody a podcast, they don't know where to listen to it. Like, I think that that's pretty easily figure outable. That's not a word, but easy to figure out. I think with podcasts, it's the time. They don't know where the time slot for them would go to listen to a podcast. And so people who do are into podcasts, they have that slot, right? They know yeah. I'm going to listen to this when I'm driving to work or when I'm working out or doing the dishes or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. It's that, that behavior. Um, and I think that'll change. Like, I think that's still growing a ton, mm -hmm. uh, but it is interestingly, like for those of us who are in the world, it's hard to conceive of that, but like, yeah. it, it's easy to forget that you're in a subculture when like we're surrounded by it. Sure. A hundred percent. Well, Eric, listen, this has been a ton of fun. Uh, I'm so glad that we got to sit down and talk for a little bit. Um, I've learned a lot. It's been so fun to nerd out about this stuff that I can't really nerd out about with just on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, I know that when you wrote the book, you set out to have the most quotable book or the most highlighted book. And I wanted to tell you that I think you accomplished that even though I actually, when I was, so I have a physical book version of it. And then I recently got the digital because I didn't want to carry on a book with me. And I noticed just how much of it I was highlighting. And then I stopped and I thought, I can't actually highlight this much because <laughs> like, it's actually all tweets. So literally this is a book of highlighted things and I'm just highlighting everything. And I almost now, because of it, don't highlight as much because now in order to highlight something, it needs to be really, really good. You know what I mean? Like, so I'm like, almost like, th like the first, like third of the book is super highlighted. And then afterwards it's like, all right, now I need to take like an even finer tooth comb through it. Cause otherwise I'm just going to be reading the book in highlights. So yeah. I think you accomplished the most quotable and highlighted book, even though I didn't realize this was your goal. And I realized that I kind of like, like, you know, pulled the go out for you, but um, yeah, it's, it's a fantastic book. I highly recommend it. Where can people get that book uh, if they're interested? Uh, so navalmanac.com with a CK um, has everything for the book. The book is available for free in like PDF and EPUB and Mobi, and you can read it all on the website. Um, if you want to buy the physical copy or the Kindle copy, you can do that on Amazon. Um, but everything's on there. Uh, I got a Twitter account that like kind of shares some of the highlights from there. But uh, yeah, I'm waiting on the, the Readwise. Um, do you use Readwise, by the way? Yeah, I do. Okay, I'm waiting on the Readwise like highlight density scoreboard for 2021 because I want to see if we, if we reach this goal. Um, no thanks to you, but yeah, I, I believe, wasn't helping. I still believe. I'll, I'll, I'll go in there and I'll just highlight <laughs> even more stuff. But I wonder if uh, Tim is going to be because I think he has the highest one at the moment. Isn't the Far Work Week like the most highlighted book or, on Amazon or something like that? I wonder if he'll be pissed for writing the foreword if uh, you know you end up beating him. No, he deserves all the credit for it. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's fine. He'll be he'll be cool with that. Well, Eric, thank you so much. Seriously, um, I appreciate it so much. We're going to have links to everything that you mentioned that we talked about, the website, the course, you know, the Twitter account, everything on the show notes. So uh, if you're interested, if you're listening, definitely head on over and check it out. Eric, thank you so much, man. Uh, I really appreciate it. Thanks, Miko. This was fun, man. I like it a lot.